Now, I'm going to mention a couple of other people at the end, but I want to just now make some remarks myself. Uh, I remember the countless times when I was at the other end of the house with the TV on or the radio on, and I would hear in the distance the fragment of a word, and I immediately knew it was Laurie Carmichael speaking. Millions of Australians came to know his distinctive voice. His projection was so good he could address a mass meeting of thousands of workers without a microphone. Laurie is an electrifying public speaker, not because of his slightly elevated gravel growl, but because of the content of what he has to say. I, along with thousands of other workers, have listened carefully for hours to his rousing critical analysis of the countless challenges that face the working class. Just think of the extraordinary achievement. A notorious communist union leader, pilloried and demonised by the press, who's still to this day quoted favourably by Heather Ridout, head of the Australian Industry Group and reputed secret member of the Australian Cabinet. And by Bert Evans, the former head of the Australian Industry Group. Laurie also provided valued advice which was actually acted upon to Bob Hawke, Paul Keating, Kim Beasley and to John Dawkins who were the leadership of the previous Labor government. And this was despite the fact that Paul Keating was a passionate supporter of free market deregulation which Laurie continues to abhor. When Laurie was Secretary of the Victorian branch of the union, there were many more members per official than there are today. And this was based on the high level of political and trade union education amongst union delegates who could effectively organise and pattern bargain without the need for a full-time official. And Laurie's been a passionate believer in working class education throughout his years as a union official and it was built on that tradition. Laurie as an apprentice was involved in the successful struggle by apprentices to achieve paid time off to attend TAFE rather than having to attend night classes. There are lots of people on the left who believe that the Accord period was a disaster for the trade union movement and the Accord was an act of class collaboration which demobilised organised labour. A book by a bloke called Tom Bramble is being launched this week which perpetuates this line. In fact it's such a strong labour movement orthodoxy that we have trouble in our union finding resources which take a different line to use in our trade union training. There's no doubt that Laurie Carmichael was a key architect of the Accord. Without Laurie, there would have been no Accord. I think the facts speak for themselves. Even today, the highest union density is in those countries where we have the most centralised bargaining, either at an industry level or at an economy-wide level. The greatest level of social equity and social solidarity is where we have the highest union density. And the greatest union strength is not always where there are the longest strikes. In fact, long strikes are sometimes an expression of relative, relative weakness. It's actually where the threat of a strike produces a result because the employers and government understand the organised power that lies behind it, that the best outcomes are achieved. The accord was entered into from a position of strength for organised labour. It came on the back of a successful struggle for the shorter working week in the metal industry, the 38-hour week, and Laurie Carmichael was the leading architect of that campaign. It came on the back of strong union density. Some 70% of metal tradespeople were members of the union at the beginning of the Accord period in 1983. The Accord actually promised and delivered. It delivered the industry policy that we needed. The car industry and the steel industries would not have survived without the Button Plan, a plan which came directly from the Accord. It delivered Medicare, a system which even 11 years of John Howard could not destroy. And you've only got to look at health care for workers in the United States to realise just how important that achievement is. It delivered universal superannuation for workers and many other things. In the early period of the Accord, there were many mobilisations and points of pressure which Laurie was involved in the leadership of. 
Keating's plan for a consumption tax was defeated. There was the opportunity, uh, which then of course Howard introduced later on, there was the opportunity to shift focus to important issues around jobs, industry development, education and training and work organisation. This opportunity was taken up with vigour and Laurie played a leading role in that. Laurie was the driving force behind Australia Reconstructed and I urge you to go back and have a look at Australia Reconstructed. It's very hard to imagine a government today in Australia being part of such a radical process. Certainly there was some decline in union density during the early period of the Accord, some of which was linked to structural changes in economy. But the big decline in the union density came in the latter period of the Accord with moves to economic and labour market deregulation, including enterprise bargaining. And Laurie worked hard against these developments, which did dramatically reduce union power and union density, and were also accompanied by a decline in rank and file engagement and confidence. The productivity trade-off agenda, the privatisation agenda, and the free market ideology, which paved the way for what we now see as extreme capitalism in the current financial crisis, was the real problem. It was the cancer which led to disillusionment and resentment, not the original accord, and Laurie remained resolutely opposed to that. One of the positive opportunities that was opened up by the accord was trade union engagement on the issues of skills and training. And Laurie worked with many people, a number of whom are guests with us tonight, on this successful project, which established for the first time career paths in awards and training opportunities for millions of workers, and which led to the development for the first time of a world-class training system in Australia. John Dawkins, who was Minister in the Labor Government and is here tonight, was the person with a vision and courage to set that process rolling. Paul Byrne and Bill Mansfield, who are also here tonight, were also a very important part of the process. And Doug Cameron played a leading role in the industrial mobilisation that was essential for these achievements. At one point we had to hold four hour stop works throughout the industry to pressure the MTIA, as they were then called, to stop delaying the introduction of the career path. There was a big struggle internally within the union, led by Laurie, to get support for the strategy. Prior to this, a fitter was a fitter was a fitter and it was seen as elitist and divisive in some quarters to suggest that those who had higher skills and qualifications should be classified at a higher level. However, the time was right. Massive restructuring was occurring and this was a strategy to ensure that workers had a say in how work reorganisation occurred, whether it was going to be a high skill road or a low skill road of work intensification. This was also a strategy to ensure that workers had a share of the productivity gains, a strategy to ensure that workers retained portable qualifications to underpin their value in the labour market rather than narrow enterprise specific skills. And it was also the way to achieve the learning workplace and recognise the dignity and autonomy of skilled workers, to bring together work and learning, theory and practice, and lifelong learning opportunities. These themes were driven by Laurie and they are still central to our work today. And it's hardly surprising that Laurie made this a central struggle because he reflects the motto of lifelong learning in his own life and practice and he spread that to the union.